Mr. George Kerry. Kerry. Yes. Sorry, Mr. Kerry. Moderator, on Tuesday the 6th of January, the Presbytery of Aberdeen met to consider the call from Queen's Cross Church to the Reverend Scott Rennie. Mr. Rennie is already serving as a minister of the Church of Scotland at Brecon Cathedral in the Presbytery of Angus. Aberdeen Presbytery was informed that Mr. Rennie had been properly elected by the congregation of Queen's Cross after preaching there as nominee on Sunday the 23rd of November. The call which was presented to Presbytery was well subscribed, having been signed by 246 people on the electoral register and with 13 further papers of concurrence. At its meeting, the Presbytery of Aberdeen agreed to sustain this call. 13 members of Presbytery subsequently chose to dissent and complain. The essence of the complaint is contained in the documents that have been placed before the General Assembly. On behalf of the Presbytery of Aberdeen, we now respond to this complaint. The complaint alleges that the Presbytery of Aberdeen has acted wrongly in sustaining the call to the Reverend Scott Rennie. The complaint also alleges that Aberdeen Presbytery has acted contrary to the spirit of prayerful dialogue urged upon the church by the General Assembly of 2007. A great deal of publicity has been generated by this case, nearly all of which has focused on the single issue of a minister being in a same-sex relationship. However, a number of different issues are actually at stake in this case. We believe that it's essential for the General Assembly to consider all of these before deciding whether or not the Presbytery of Aberdeen acted wrongly. It is our opinion that to do otherwise would convey a message that the end can justify the means in the Church of Scotland. In other words, we will be telling the world that the Church has a right to ignore just and fair processes whenever people feel strongly about a particular issue. In this instance, we ask the General Assembly to consider the following. Should the Presbytery of Aberdeen have ex been expected to ignore the principles of natural justice? Should the Presbytery of Aberdeen have taken the unprecedented step of vetoing a congregation's call to a minister on the grounds of conduct? Who is actually forcing the hand of the National Church by curtailing a time of prayerful dialogue and by demanding that a definitive decision must now be taken. And then finally, how ought the Church of Scotland to be expressing the love of Christ towards gay and lesbian people? In relation to the first of these issues, we believe that the Presbytery of Aberdeen has upheld the values of natural justice. As has been explained, natural justice provides a basic measure of procedural fairness. It is an established principle, both within and out with the church, that the proceedings of courts should comply with its demands. There are essentially two great rules of natural justice which safeguard the position of any individual who is likely to be affected by a judgment. Firstly, such an individual is entitled to be heard. Secondly, those who are involved in considering a case must be impartial from the outset and free from bias. When the Presbytery of Aberdeen considered the call from Queen's Cross Church, the interim moderator moved that the call should be sustained. A counter motion was then proposed by Mr. Aitken asking Presbytery not to sustain the call to Mr. Rennie, believing his conduct to be censurable by the word of God and by the custom of the church. The Presbytery was clearly being invited to make a judgment about Mr. Rennie's conduct. However, the Presbytery was being asked to do this when Mr. Rennie was absent, a situation which normally prevails when a minister is being called from another Presbytery. If the Presbytery had declined the call, in the terms that were being proposed by Mr. Aitken, it would have been making a judgment about Mr. Rennie, 
without affording him the hearing that natural justice demands. It is never sufficient to make a judgment against someone simply because people hold strong opinions about a particular issue. It is not sufficient to judge somebody as guilty even if there seems to be evidence in hand. Any individual is entitled to be heard. That is a basic rule of natural justice. Do we have to agree with people to defend them from injustice? The General Assembly often makes statements about justice, speaking up for those who are being treated less than fairly. We did that yesterday when we received the report of the Church and Society Council affirming the rights of people at home and overseas. What message will it give if the Church of Scotland now departs from such a foundational principle of justice in the way that it treats its own ministers? The Church of Scotland has established procedures in place which enable complaints about a minister's conduct to be considered in a just and fair manner. Those procedures are contained in Act 3, 2001, and it is an integral part of those procedures that a minister has the right to be heard. However, Act 3 can only be applied by a minister's own presbytery, and in the case of Mr. Rennie, that is clearly the presbytery of Angus. Instead of an approach being made to the Presbytery of Angus, which could justly consider the matter, the Presbytery of Aberdeen was asked to do what it could not justly do. We also believe that the Presbytery behaved correctly in upholding the right of a congregation to call its minister. Mr. Aitken has contended that a congregation doesn't have an absolute right of call it's that a call is always subject to a presbytery's approval. However, a presbytery's role in the process is always quite specific. A presbytery is supposed to ensure that a call truly expresses a congregation's wishes, that procedures have been followed correctly, and that the number of signatures on a call is adequate. A call has always been about the covenant relationship between a congregation and a minister. This has been the historical purpose of a subscribed call. Indeed, it was an established practice for church members to sign a call even before the disruption, when the local laird still had the right to choose a parish minister. The paper call allowed the congregation to issue their own invitation. One of the Kirk's earliest law books indicates that a call gave the people an opportunity of encouraging the labors of their future minister by addressing to him this invitation. From its earliest beginnings, a call reflected the relationship between a congregation and minister. In 1874, congregations were granted additional rights of electing and appointing their ministers. While calls continue to be presented to presbyteries, the involvement of presbyteries has remained quite specific. A presbytery is required to ensure that a call represents a genuine invitation and that a minister is in a practical position to accept that calling. It has never been a presbytery's role to veto an appointment after judging a minister's conduct or character. A presbytery simply ensures that procedures have been properly followed and that a call has been adequately subscribed. The Presbytery of Aberdeen was given no reason whatsoever to doubt the reliability of the call from Queen's Cross. Mr. Rennie had clearly been elected by a legitimate vote. The call from the congregation was one of the best subscribed in recent times within the Presbytery. The congregation's representative spoke with eagerness about Mr. Rennie's future ministry. In a practical sense, Mr. Rennie was in a position to accept that call. A call is about the relationship between a congregation and a minister, and in this case, the congregation's wishes were entirely clear. The complaint alleges that Aberdeen Presbytery has acted contrary to the commitment to prayerful dialogue, 
which was urged on the church by the General Assembly of 2007. It has been claimed that the presbytery has introduced something new, that it has gone ahead of the church's established position in ways that will bring the present time of reflection to a close. We contend that this assertion is unfounded. The only change that is being proposed is the translation of a minister who is already serving in the Church of Scotland. Over and above that, the Presbytery of Aberdeen is not introducing any new circumstance to the Church of Scotland. <coughs> Mr. Rennie's personal circumstances would remain exactly the same, regardless of whether he continues to serve at Brecon Cathedral, Cathedral or moves to Queen's Cross Church. Many would acknowledge that the church has actually been engaging in discussion and dialogue for at least 15 years. The General Assembly of 1994 helped to establish that position after two boards of the church presented conflicting reports on issues relating to sexuality. At the time, the General Assembly discussed both of those reports, but consciously chose not to vote on the recommendations of either. Since then, the General Assembly has deliberately avoided expressing absolute views on sexuality. In practical terms, this has created 15 years of breathing space. At the end of those 15 years, is it really unprecedented for a minister to be in a same-sex relationship? The church that created breathing space has been a church in which people have been more able to be themselves. Are there no other situations in the Kirk where the privacy of individual ministers has been recognized and their gifts recognized? Would the induction of Mr. Rennie really be the unique departure that it has been portrayed to be? In a church with breathing space, we already have gay and lesbian people, some in relationships, serving as elders, counted in our membership, and worshiping in our pews week by week. They too are known, loved, and treasured in their local church communities. None of those situations has been deemed to curtail prayerful dialogue. This time, the time of discussion and dialogue was initiated by a general assembly which decided not to express definitive views. If that time is now being ended, we do not believe it is the result of anything that the Presbytery of Aberdeen has done. The local decision to sustain the call from Queen's Cross Church was not forcing the hand of the National Church. It is perhaps this process of dissent and complaint which is now pushing the General Assembly to make a decision. Aberdeen Presbytery never had any desire to bring this matter before the General Assembly. It is only present today as a respondent party. For the reasons that I have stated, we don't believe that Aberdeen Presbytery was wrong to sustain the call. The Presbytery has upheld the principles of natural justice, and it has remained true to the historical purpose of the call. We strongly deny that our Presbytery has curtailed prayerful dialogue. We contend that those reasons are self-standing, and that they justify the decision to sustain the call from Queen's Cross Church. We would, however, wish to affirm that this is not just about principles, it is also about people. An important question now faces the General Assembly. How ought the Church of Scotland to express the love of Christ towards gay and lesbian people in this country? In the course of the past 50 years, the common understanding of homosexuality has changed enormously both within and out with the church. Homosexuality was once considered to be an illness or a lifestyle choice. Many, many people now believe that such a view is untenable, considering instead that sexual orientation is part of an individual's makeup. This enlightened understanding has generated a much more compassionate view of gay and lesbian people, both in society and in the church. Indeed, two years ago, the General Assembly ratified its own act anent discrimination, 
acknowledging the reality of sexual orientation and making it illegal for the church to discriminate on such grounds. This morning, the General Assembly received the report of the Committee of Ecumenical Relations, which included a section about dialogue with the Free Church of Scotland. The report reminded us of the Kirk's approach to Scripture. It is a foundational principle of the Church of Scotland that the Scriptures can be reinterpreted with the guidance of the Holy Spirit and in the light of our human experience. The Church has demonstrated its willingness to do that in relation to its teaching on slavery, divorce, and the position of women. In so doing, the Church has recognized that its understanding of God's will can change in different times and places. Given that willingness to reassess, it is perhaps extraordinary that we struggle so much with this one particular issue. When we look to the Scriptures, we discover that Jesus never spoke about sexual orientation. When we look to gay and lesbian people, we might ask ourselves how Jesus would have approached them. Throughout the Gospels, we find an overwhelming message that Jesus often embraced those who were rejected by religious authorities. Are we really being called to break up households and committed relationships? Are we actually to tell people, because of the way that God has made you, you must live alone and you cannot have a life companion? The church now has a real opportunity to show Christ's love. It can be brave enough to play its part by helping to depart from some of the discriminatory attitudes of the past. We might remember what Mark Twain wrote about the abolition of slavery. Loyalty to petrified opinion never yet broke a chain or freed a human soul in this world, and never will. Moderator, on behalf of the Presbytery of Aberdeen, I thank the General Assembly for receiving this reply.